We together will work to make downtown Winnipeg a vibrant, livable, workable and safe place. Tonight some big plans are afoot to revitalize the center of Winnipeg. Uh, it's always good um, having these kind of events for the community. Yeah. The spirit of giving comes to Iqaluit. I think for them to use this now uh, as a claim that we're trying to intrude into their land is clearly uh, wrong. It's truly, it's really grasping at straws. And controversy reigns over Métis signs on unceded Algonquin territory. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin in Ottawa tonight where the Trudeau government announced the creation of a new Indigenous housing centre on Wednesday. The government says it's to address the housing needs of First Nations, Métis and Inuit people living away from their home communities. In the 2023 budget, the Liberals announced $4 billion over seven years as part of a national urban, rural and northern Indigenous housing strategy. The Indigenous Housing Centre will play a major role in overseeing how this funding is distributed for housing units across the country. Here's what Housing Minister Sean Fraser had to say about the new centre outside the House of Commons. The funding will be invested uh, first through the creation uh, of a national, uh, national Indigenous Housing Centre. In order to uh, move forward with this first key stream, we will be launching a request for proposals in January of this year with the view to selecting a, an organization to run the National Centre by March of 2024. This is going to provide an enormous opportunity and we're going to empower Indigenous leaders to actually make the decisions about how this funding will be administered. Still in Ottawa, Prime Minister Trudeau was on his feet for much of today's question period. Alberta NDP MP Blake Desjardins slammed him over the lack of action to bring food prices down and having, in his words, a humbug Christmas spirit. Edmonton families are making tough choices this winter. Put food on the table or buy Christmas presents for their kids. But who's stealing Christmas this year? Is it Scrooge? Is it the Grinch? No, it's the Liberal Conservative Corporate Coalition. They've let their grocery CEO friends jack up prices to make record profits while Canadians turn to food banks for Christmas dinner. Why is the government okay with letting grocery CEOs ruin the holiday? families this winter. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've actually taken real actions to hold grocery CEOs to account with more competition, because more competition means lower prices, more choice and more innovative products and services for Canadians. Our affordability legislation will empower the Competition Bureau to hold grocers accountable and prioritize consumers' interests. The fall economic statement proposes further amendments to the Competition Act to crack down on predatory pricing and better respond to anti-competitive mergers and more. We're ensuring Canadians have more competitive options and we're limiting excess profits by corporations at the expense of Canadians. An update now on a story we shared last week about Manitoba Métis Federation signage being removed at an Ottawa airport. Sav Jones has more on why it was removed and what may replace it. These signs promoting the Manitoba Métis Federation in the Ottawa McDonald Cartier International Airport were removed by their airport authority soon after receiving a complaint that it was both political and offensive. For somebody to come along now and say that the Reverend Métis sign, the Reverend government is offensive, that's a sad, sad day in this, in this new era. It was the only complaint the signs had received in the 13 months it was displayed. They were promptly removed with no consultation with the MMF. The, the complainant was Chief Dylan White Duck of Kitigan ZB and Anishinaabeg, a First Nation two hours away from the airport. Of, of he process, sent out a joint press got, uh, release with Chief Greg Sarazen of Algonquins of Pickawakanagan, a First Nation also near the airport. They state in part that the sign had the potential to create confusion regarding the territory's ownership and that they intend to replace it with their own sign, welcoming airport goers to the unceded Algonquin territory.
Manitoba Métis Federation President David Chartrand says the signs made no claim to land in order to educate people about the Red River Métis. I think for them to use this now uh, as a claim that we're trying to intrude into their land is clearly uh, wrong. It's truly, it's really grasping at straws. The MMF has similar signs in the Winnipeg Richardson International Airport and billboards throughout Manitoba. Chartrand hasn't heard directly from Chiefs White Duck or Sarazen, but wonders if they have the MMF confused as a supporter of the proposed Bill C-53. If passed, the bill will allow self-government to the Métis Nation of Ontario, something several First Nations in Ontario are against. So maybe they got us mixed up with the Ontario Métis. Maybe that's something where White Duck made a big mistake, thinking we're Ontario or supporters of Ontario. We're not supporting Ontario. We're actually supporting the First Nations of Ontario against the Métis Nation of Ontario or having uh, a false claim of their identity, bringing this so-called new historical Métis, which do not exist in our books, and they're not related in any fashion to our people of the West. And We've reached out to Chiefs White Duck and Sarazen multiple times for an interview, but have not heard back. Chartrand says he isn't upset with who made the complaint, but that the signs were taken down without consultation during a two-year contract with Astral Media. It, it did, could have been White Duck, it could have been a non-Indigenous person, it could have been anybody who made a complaint. And yet the board just made a decision, okay, I agree, I agree with you, it's offensive. When asked why they removed the signs so quickly after only one complaint, and how the signs were deemed offensive and political, the Ottawa International Airport Authority said, Based on discussions with the complainant, as the chief of his community and his stated views on how his people were offended and perceived it as political, we believe this met the criteria outlined in our advertising standards. Chartrand says he is sending a letter to the chairman of the board concerning the removal and will use legal means to address the issue if necessary. When asked if the MMF will put their signage only within the Métis homeland going forward, President Chartrand shook his head. No, of course not. I'm going to put signs. And if I, if I was to say now that I got to get permission from everybody in the world to promote who I am, then there'd be a hell of a problem in this country for freedom of speech. Sav Jonza, APTN National News, Winnipeg. We're always looking to hear from you, whether it's about this story or a story idea you might have. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, you can send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, go to aptnnews.ca. You can find us also online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Thunder Bay's chief of police hosted a cultural gathering on Monday with First Nations leaders and city officials. Darcy Fleury, who is Métis and a former Mountie, was sworn in as chief of the embattled police service in May. We get more from reporter Mitchell Ringos and our friends at Thunder Bay Television. After taking over the role as chief of the Thunder Bay Police Service roughly seven months ago, Darcy Fleury has taken another step forward by holding an open forum with First Nation leaders and organizations in an effort to create stronger communications and hopefully rebuild trust between Indigenous people and the city's police service. Fleury says this forum wasn't meant to forget what happened in the past, but to learn from it and move forward together. You know, we think we might be doing a great job, but sometimes we need to hear from the community, well, how good are we doing? And, and what areas are we deficient in and what areas need to be improving? Otherwise, we're not going to be able to, uh, you know, make the changes that we need. So that, that's kind of what, what drives it all. The forum happened to be held on the fifth anniversary of the release of the Office of the Independent Police Review Director's report that found systematic racism at an institutional level within the Thunder Bay Police Service. Anishinaabeg Nation Grand Chief Reg Niganabi says he is pleased to see the police service has been working toward completing the recommendations and that all parties are finally communicating. Just to hear some of the updates that are taking place so far, it's good to hear that some of them are being implemented and that there is some action. That's the biggest one for me. 
Uh, the second one is that we're actually having this event and the communication is open now. Fort William Chief Michelle Solomon agreed that the forum with First Nation leadership is an important first step in rebuilding trust among Indigenous people and police. I think that police might be received better if they were present um, in community at a, a level that was not um, too not a level of enforcement, but a level of, you know, hello, how are you doing? And, um, you know, just understanding people better. Solomon added, even though this was a big first step, rebuilding trust goes beyond just the city police force. This is more than a police issue for sure. You know, if we look at all institutions that Indigenous people encounter on a daily basis, they encounter barriers and systemic racism in all institutions. Fleury said he will be working to ensure what is being heard at the forum will be implemented on the front line, including the continuation of reconciliation training for all members of the Thunder Bay Police Service, which Fleury said is on track to be completed in 2025, as well as policy reviews by the Police Services Board. We do the procedures, we want to get it out there so that uh, they have a, a, a fairly good understanding of where we're going and have some input into it. Fleury said these forums are intended to be an ongoing process with hopes of scheduling a second one in late spring or early fall next year. Mitchell Ringo's TBT News. A new report checking in on reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people has been released. We'll tell you about the findings after the break. Welcome back. In Winnipeg, the development arm of the company that owns the Winnipeg Jets and the Southern Chiefs organization have formed a partnership. They're joining forces to redevelop the old Bay Building and Portage Place Mall. Both sides signed a Memorandum of Understanding Tuesday, committing to their partnership. CTV's Jeff Keel has more. Redevelopment plans for two major downtown projects are moving forward in lockstep. We together will work to make downtown Winnipeg a vibrant, livable, workable and safe place. The Southern Chiefs Organization and True North's real estate branch signed an agreement to partner on the Bay and Portage Place in a move seen as economic reconciliation. SCO's plans for the Bay and our plans for Portage Place will be far more impactful if done in collaboration, where we both actively seek out what is good for one another. SCO owns the Bay and True North is in the process of potentially buying them all. Both projects include elements of health care and housing. 300 plus units at the Bay, more than 200 at Portage Place. True North says since it started exploring options for them all seven months ago, its initial focus has changed. We now see it as a social redevelopment plan first, a real estate development second. That is the hope that these two projects can help turn downtown around, help those struggling with homelessness, addictions and mental health, and fill empty storefronts. So the biggest thing that businesses need right now are more residents living downtown. I think the job creation and the training and the employment and the health care, all of those things are going to uh, create a better social economic outcome. But there are hurdles to get over. The costs have already gone up. The Bay from 130 million to 200 million. Portage Place 550 to 650 million. All levels of government have committed funding towards the Bay. The city and province did offer tax grants to the failed Portage Place deal involving Starlight Investments. Our administration is, is going to be there in multiple ways and we look forward to being able to, to announce those details in the future. We already have a tax increment for, uh, financing policy and funding in place uh, for, our, for our community and for our downtown. So the specifics are yet to be worked out. Jeff Keel, CTV News, Winnipeg. To northern Alberta now, where a hibernating black bear near the Imperial-owned Curl Oil Sand project had to be euthanized after a heavy piece of equipment fell on its unseen den. The incident happened on December 6th. A local contractor hired by Imperial were building a drill pad when the incident occurred. In a statement to APTN, Imperial says the area had been scanned for dens birds' nests and wildlife by an Indigenous-owned third party. That third party cleared the area for construction. Imperial says proper authorities were notified, so were local Indigenous communities. 
Imperial says they are investigating how to ensure incidents like this are not repeated. The 2022 Canadian Reconciliation Barometer Report is out. It measures reconciliation in Canada between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. Rai Moran is the Associate University Librarian of Reconciliation at the University of Victoria and part of the team that worked on the report. He's also a founding director of the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation and he joins us now from Victoria. Rai, great to see you. Uh, this is the second time the reconciliation barometer has been done. Uh, can you tell us about the barometer and, and what sticks out for you this year? Yeah, well, the barometer is uh, is an effort to try to add an additional tool into the toolkit of helping us collectively understand where we are, perhaps where we're not in regards to this broad journey, this broad national journey of truth and reconciliation. Um, specifically, the barometer does not track the calls to action. What it tries to do is, is measure sort of people's perceptions or understandings of feelings, if you will, of where we're at. Uh, one of the things that really sticks out this year is, well, it's a bit of a two-pronged story. On the one hand, awareness is really up, especially within uh, non-Indigenous Canadians of residential schools. Uh, that jumped almost 30%, actually, which is quite incredible. We can think about why that is. There's obviously been a huge amount of discussion in the country in the last couple of years. Inversely, though, uh, you know, we're not seeing a lot of engagement. Um, we're seeing that, you know, we've got a lot of work to do still on the quality of the relationship. Yeah, one of the things that stuck out for me was that uh, Indigenous respondents continue to believe that groups that have harmed Indigenous peoples have not taken full responsibility, while non Indigenous people think groups have done enough. Uh, can you talk about that divide? Yeah, I think that's that kind of starts to get at the heart of some of the things that are holding us back, I think, as a, as a society. One of the things that sticks out at me, in addition to that stat, is that non-Indigenous people are typically reporting now that they have a pretty good understanding of the past and the present. But when we look at how much they're actually engaging, say, for example, taking a part in cultural events or actually working on justice uh, uh, with Indigenous peoples, we see the, those numbers are very, very low. So I think in many ways, part of the story here is, is that Canadians, non-Indigenous Canadians, are, are maybe thinking we're further along the path than we are. And we really should see this as an opportunity to kind of redouble the efforts to, to build deeper and more meaningful understanding of, of really um, who we are as Indigenous peoples, frankly. Well, as you mentioned, you know, there was that big jump in the awareness of residential schools year over year. Uh, you kind of touched on it there, but what are some of the other areas do you think that uh, more education is needed? Yeah, I, I think uh, deepening the understanding. So uh, a couple of the stats that we, we really look at are, um, are we living in an equitable society? Um, so interestingly there, uh, the majority of non-Indigenous Canadians would say, no, we're not living in an equitable society. And this is something, obviously, that Indigenous peoples are agreeing with. You know, the change that's needed is something that we really got to get people digging into deeply. And I think this is where the other reports that are out there right now, ones like from the Yellowhead Institute and from uh, Indigenous Watchdog, that are tracking specific implementation of the TRC's calls to action really become super important because these are the ones that are, are telling us uh, how seriously uh, we're actually taking those calls to action. And, and we're eight years out. I mean, it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, December 15th marks eight years since the TRC's reports were released. Uh, and it's, it's telling that only a handful of those calls to action have actually been fully implemented. Indeed. Well, hey, Rye, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, awesome to get a chance to speak with you now that you've left us behind in this tundra of Winnipeg. <laughs> but uh, appreciate you taking some time for us today. Thanks for having me on. Okay, time for one more quick break still to come. Getting into the Christmas spirit in Nunavut's capital. It feels pretty good, you know. Um, this time of year is pretty busy and everyone um, is ready for the holidays and this is just to help the community um, with food. Welcome back. Time now for a look at our photo of the day. 
Lauren Smith sent in this beauty shot of a full moon from his backyard. Thanks for sharing the winter full moon and for thinking about us here at APTN News. We want to see your photos. You can send them to share at APTN, aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Thursday's weather forecast. Starting on the east coast, minus three with snow for Halifax and Charlottetown. Minus nine and flurries in Kujuwak, eight below in Nain. Minus two, make that plus one in Montreal, two below for Val d'Or. Plus five and sunny skies for Sault Ste. Marie, two above in North Bay. Plus four in Capus Casing, sunny and eight above in Thunder Bay. Sun's out and minus one for God's Lake and Norway House. Plus four in sunny skies in Winnipeg, two above with the sun out in Dauphin. Minus two in sunny in Regina, zero for Saskatoon. Three above in Meadow Lake, plus one in La Ronge. Over in Northern Alberta, zero in Fort Chip and Fort McMurray. Plus three with snow in Edmonton, minus one in Lethbridge. Eight above in Vancouver, plus 10 with showers in Victoria. Minus one and snow in Prince George, five below for Smithers. Minus 17 and snow in Old Crow, 24 below with snow in Beaver Creek. Plus one in Yellowknife, minus 16 in Norman Wells. Minus 20 in Saks Harbor, snow and 21 below in Politak. Minus four for Chesterfield and Whale Cove, five below in Baker Lake. Minus 26 in Resolute, 28 below in Joe Haven. This week, Nunavut nonprofit Ely Tuxinuk organized a Christmas hamper distribution in the territorial capital. The distribution was funded by the Nunavut government's Community Wellness Fund and also had the support of several local businesses. It took just under 13 minutes for on-site hampers to be distributed and additional 30 hampers were delivered to those unable to make it. In addition to the usual Christmas hamper foods, there was also some caribou, arctic char and muktuk. According to organizers, there was plenty of holiday spirit to go around. Around 100 hampers were distributed or delivered in total. It feels pretty good, you know. Um, this time of year is pretty busy and everyone um, is ready for the holidays and this is just to help the community um, with food. Uh, it's always good um, having these kind of events for the community and everyone is um, really happy after and there's a lot of thank yous to go around. Awesome work there. Well, that's all the time we have for your AP10 National News for this Wednesday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, that's aptnnews.ca. And for anything you may have missed here, you can head on over to our YouTube page. That's uh, APTN News at YouTube. I'm Dennis Ward. Miigwech, Marci, thanks for being with us. Have yourself a great night.